Welcome to Today at Wayne, a podcast that engages and informs the Wayne State University campus community. With news, announcements, information, and current events discussions relevant to the university's goals and mission, Today at Wayne serves as the perfect forum for our campus to begin a conversation or keep one going. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Today at Wayne podcast. I'm Daryl Dawsey. After decades spent amassing the largest incarcerated population in the world, the United States has in recent years sought to reduce the nation's prison population and seek new alternatives to mass imprisonment. For many of the men and women who spent part of their lives behind bars, this new push means that more of them are returning home each year and are looking to turn their lives around. And if they are to succeed, they will need greater access to jobs, training, and education. Now that help is on its way, thanks in part to a new program developed by Wayne State University and led by WSU College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean Stephanie Hartwell. Bolstered by a $200,000 grant from the Michigan Justice Fund, the new program hopes to boost the success and uh, the economic mobility of formerly incarcerated individuals by clearing a pathway from prison to higher education. And here to talk with us about this new program is one of the principal architects of the initiative herself, Dean Stephanie Hartwell. Welcome. Hi, Daryl. How are you? Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Wonderful to have you on. Very appreciative of you taking the time to join us. So um, let's just kind of get into this. Why don't you start by telling us about this, uh, about the new program and uh, and how it works. So I was lucky enough to talk to some folks from Corrections and then from the Michigan Justice Fund about the kind of initiatives they were interested in funding. And I had done a lot of proof of concept work in Massachusetts around transitioning individuals from incarceration back to the community. But that formative work was done with individuals who had mental illness or major mental illness. So we were doing transition programming for individuals with mental illness. And that program was called the Forensic Transition Team. Um, A woman, a social worker from Massachusetts named Karen Orr helped develop the concept with me. We did a program of evaluation. I believe the program's still around today. I've been gone from Massachusetts for almost five years, but it, 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 it was around previous to that for 20 years and helped transition individuals and was a statewide program. So it grew and became a statewide program and had positive program evaluation numbers. Uh, It was efficacious, cost effective, helped individuals and helped them get the services they need. So trying to wear multiple hats in my role as Dean, but also as a program evaluator and a sociologist, I, I thought, you know, let's use that proof of concept and shift it to higher ed. So one thing that folks don't know is that, in fact, recidivism rates are less the more education you get. So they're, they're, they correlate, they're inversely correlated. Okay. And the higher you go, secondary education is the gold standard because folks are 62% less to recid- likely to recidivate or go back to prison. Mm-hmm. So getting an associate's degree at a community college or a bachelor's degree of, at a four-year institution changes that uh, that equation substantially, even more so than having gainful employment. Mm -hmm. So, and folks find that difficult um, to understand. And in discussions about the education transition coordination program, we we want folks to understand that that either way, taxpayers are paying for for these individuals. If they're behind bars, it costs X amount of dollars. If they're um, going to school on Pell eligible grants or other grants, it costs tax dollars but a more civil society is the result of the higher education and less recidivism. We've, we've seen a, a sort of reduction in mass incarceration in the country uh, over the years and proponents have come from you know, both sides of the political aisle, all parts of the political spectrum. Uh, and a big part of the push is because we're trying to save money, right? I mean, it's just, it, it, it just made no sense to incarcerate folks at that level, especially given the costs. Um, can you kind of give us some sense of you know, what this means in terms of the cost now, the money that, you know, would have been spent locking some of these folks up or keeping people behind bars is spent trying to help these folks get an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. Can you give us some sense of what the what the trade-off is from a cost standpoint? Sure. I, you know, I could try. And so the mass incarceration, the, the reduction is that is because we've learned that it's, it's not good for anybody. And that these folks, even 98% or 97% of prisoners are returned to the community. It's, it's people that are incarcerated are returned to the community at some point, mm-hmm. but they're 
very likely to recidivate within three years, very high rates of recidivism. So dependent on the state, states spend different per capita per person amount on um, incarceration. States like Massachusetts, more liberal states spend about $60,000 a year on individuals. States down in the South, I, I used to, when I taught criminal justice, I'd be like, you don't want to be incarcerated in Alabama because <laughs> spend, you know, eight to $10,000 a year. There's not a lot of services. So, uh, so each state is, is different, but it is residential costs, right? It's, it's food, it's, it's programming, it's shelter, it's healthcare. So it's expensive in, in a year, depending on where you go to school, is, is less than $60,000, less than $30,000. So, so that exchange is important to understand. Because some folks say, well, why does this individual who committed a crime and was found guilty have the right to a higher ed? Well, anybody has the right to higher ed who can access it. Um, but I think what folks don't understand is the impact um, and the effect it has on recidivism rates and, and that decline and how it can change an individual from being disruptive and costly to a community and harmful in the neighborhoods to being a productive citizen who creates meaning okay. um, and passes that along to their family. Absolutely. And so I think that's important. Okay. Um, that, that you, you mentioned families and that's something I want to talk a little bit about. We talk about the impact on the individuals themselves who are kind of coming home, these returning citizens. What does this mean for our homes? What does this mean for our neighborhoods? What does this mean for our communities in terms of the positive beneficial impact? So uh, I started this work in Boston in a program called um, Boston Uncornered and, and I'm trying to think the umbrella organization. It was about bringing gang members and getting them into high school, getting them GED and getting them into college courses. But the idea was, and, and it had proof of concept, was that if you could help these individuals get educated and be positive pro-social influencers on their neighborhood, mm -hmm. is better than having them come out and return to the gang and be on the corner doing negative things. Uh, so in, in the, the larger umbrella organization was called College Bound Dorchester okay. that I work for, and I helped them do some program evaluation. And so this, these ideas, the Educational Transition Program, uh, came from sort of that formative work in Boston, transitioning individuals with the mental health issues, but also the work with Boston Uncornered and College Bound Dorchester around the principles and um, larger meaning of higher education in people's lives. Okay. And so if you could help change how a person behaves at home, in the community, with their families, it makes a huge difference too, because all these things have ripple effects. Absolutely. Now, um, are there people, has the program actually kicked off? I know there's talk about you guys receiving this $200,000 grant. So I'm just wondering where, where things are in terms of the development and the actual implementation of the program. So we have a fantastic steering committee with folks from the community, from HMSA, um, that's our community partner. So when folks are released, they can be plugged into all the services in addition to higher ed. And uh, the Michigan Department of Corrections, we have fantastic partners. We have consultants that have formerly spent time incarcerated before. We've hired the Educational Transition Coordinator, the ETC, as we call him, Terrell Tops. He's fantastic. He's a Wayne State alumni. We have a research assistant who's helping me with the formative program evaluation. The steering committee meets monthly for 30 minutes. We go boom, boom, boom through everything. Um, Ty to Tyrell, the Educational Transition Coordinator, the only thing that's holding him back from going up to Jackson, which is where our partner facilities are right now, is COVID. Mm. We're hopeful he'll be able to get in facility early March, be able to log the individuals that are already taking college classes and identify and screen and intake individuals that will either be routed towards community college or Wayne State University. So the program is up and running. Uh, Tyrell is here in the Dean's office today, I believe. Um, and meeting people, meeting his connections at Wayne State, but also creating those pipelines to community colleges. So this is going to impact inmates who are already taking courses, even as they're behind bars, so that when they come out, they'll be able to just transition to an educational institution. Do, do you, can you give us some sense of how many people uh, are going to be uh, coming through the program? So our goal is 100 because it's a pilot program and 100 is a good number to analyze. Okay. Okay. <laughs> People understand 100. Right. And, right, and right. then you can, but it also has meaningful impact, right? That you're able to see some variables and some correlations with, with 100, like what the, who, who this program works for. Mm -hmm. It's a formative evaluation, which means the whole way we feed information back in the program to improve it. Um, and we learn as we go. Mm -hmm. I'm very uh, passionate about the transition piece. Sometimes that gets lost. And that in reach piece into facility and when, when individuals in, uh, immediately upon release having touch points because 
being incarcerated in sort of the total institution that being released to the community, there's a lot that can go, I always say kablooey. <laughs> so we, we need to hold on to folks and help them and make sure that they're, you know, registered for college courses, they've done their applications, they've done their financial aid forms, mm -hmm. that they're, and then they also have the mental health and, and other supports that they need in the community, transportation, housing, mental health services, whatever, whatever they should need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you say this is a pilot program. How long is it scheduled to run? And uh, at what point does the transition become a, a, a sort of a staple thing, uh, hopefully? So we have impactful outcomes. Currently, one of the drawbacks of the program, and it was as written because we knew we'd have one ed transition coordinator with support of some social work interns from Wayne State University um, that, that were working only in men's facilities, um, which to me makes me mad a little bit because I've spent most of my life studying gender differences of folks coming out. So we'd like to be able to replicate the program to women to begin with, but then also to a team of educational transition coordinators across the state and then it, have it be proof of concept, uh, a, a program that could be replicated across the country. We have big goals, uh, but we need to continue to think about funding sources and what we're looking at in terms of other grants beyond the program's two years of funding. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is wonderful and I certainly hope you're able to get the support that you need. Um, I don't wanna take up too much of your time, Dean Hartwell. I know you're a busy woman, but I'm just wondering if you could just take a couple of minutes, maybe talk to us a little bit about something maybe I haven't asked you about, or is there something you wanna emphasize about the program, maybe something that we haven't covered, you know, something that, 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 that our, uh, our, our viewers and our listeners might need to know about. Is there anything you want to share? Sure. I mean, I think that my colleagues at Wayne State have been incredibly supportive of this program and this pipeline initiative. Nobody said, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> they've, they've said, you know, Rob Davenport over in facilities has said, you know, one best, best practice that we know about is, um, work study for these individuals on campus. So if they're at Wayne State, that they're not going out to a job out in the community that might take them away from their studies or their focus on what they need to do on campus. And so uh, Rob Davenport said, I have jobs. They can come work study for facilities. Um, in food services, the same thing, just open arms, like we wanna support this program. And Terrell has reached out to advising, financial aid, uh, uh, um, Michael Quattro, who does the affiliation agreements with community colleges, and everybody's just been wonderfully welcoming and open to this idea. And you don't know, you don't always find that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's actually fantastic. This is a real deal. This is like, we are not just paper pushing. We are gonna be working with individuals that have real problems and we've built in the services that they need. Even some of the services at Wayne State are on campus. Mm -hmm. So we have mental health counseling on campus. We have a psych clinic on campus. So, so some of those things we, we do have and we have the capacity Tyrell has been working on two identifying folks already that have had an incarceration history to have peer support groups. Mm -hmm. And so we're building those pieces in and, and we're gonna learn as we go. So that, that's, I, that's the story with this. Well, we're wishing you all the best of luck. Dean Hartwell, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on the podcast. I, I, like I said, I know you're busy, but I, I really appreciate you, you stopping by for a few moments. Yeah, and thanks for finding the work interesting. I find Absolutely. it interesting too. This is, this is fantastic work. And you know, if this wins, we all win. That's the way, that's the way I think about it. That's absolutely true. All of our communities benefit. So thank you so much for this fantastic work. And thank you again for taking the time to join us here on the Today and Wayne podcast. Thanks, Daryl. Talk with you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Today at Wayne. We'd love to hear from you, our campus community, about other podcast ideas and topics. What compelling things are you doing to spread the good word about living, learning, working, and playing like a warrior? Let us know by visiting todayatwayne.edu.